Happy anniversary, Queen's Bible Church. You know, uh, it's it's an exciting morning for all of us because, um, as you probably have heard, we are uh, having four of our young ladies baptized today. And just to introduce them together um, for now, and then later on, they will be uh, called up to be baptized. Let's sing honor and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your words to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Join us, raise your voices, and celebrate together.
Brother Jay, the same time that you have known him almost two years ago, when he came here together with Brother Karim, uh, the missionary from Egypt also. Um, I brought this because I may say a lot, so I'd like to stay with it. Uh, Brother Jay actually has been with Advancing Native Missions for the past 18 years. Please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he, uh, he's a mission, he has performed different capacities. Right now he's doing three. Uh, he's the Vice President of Staff Development. And also he has been a missionary at large and as director for Comforting the Persecuted Church, Brother Jay travels to many parts of the world, world where the Lord's Church is suffering. In addition to sharing the Gospel of Jesus Christ, he researches and evaluates indigenous ministries and spends time encouraging the brethren. He has spent time with um, families of martyrs, with men and women in hiding, with brethren who have been imprisoned, with many who continue to fearlessly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, um, he travels throughout the U.S. and shares the powerful testimonies of these persecuted Christians. And um, he's also an executive director of Hope for the Muslims, uh, that's Advancing Native Missions Outreach to Muslims in America. He was actually the one who introduced us to the 30 Days of Prayer for Iran. Remember, ladies, when we did that um, um, more than a year ago? Um, whenever, this is his second time to be here, and he's here with his wife, Sister Cece. Um, she's, Brother Jay is half Filipino. Because she, Sister Cece is actually, her family is originally from Pangasinan. And they have two children. Amelia, who is now in college, and of course, Jimmy D, who is studying to be a minister. Um, to, um, actually, Jimmy D's um, hobby is scripture memorization, and he's only 17 years old. Uh, last night, I couldn't help but ask him to recite, and since, his, since September, he has recited Romans, the book of Romans. First Peter, maybe he's finished with Second Peter already, and even James. So last night we asked him, Jimmy D, could you please recite from Romans? He says, what chapter? <laughs> and he actually, Pastor Dodi said chapter 8, and he actually recited all 39 verses. And I asked him, how do you do that? He said, you have to spend time with the Word. Spend time. Um, I thought that when we, uh, this is our second time to bring Brother Jay uh, and his family, his family first time, to see the sights of Manhattan. And each time, we're thinking, oh, look at this, oh, look at that. Yesterday, when we went to 9-11 Memorial, I was just looking at them, and they were just looking around. And I thought they were looking at the sights. After a few minutes, I realized they're looking for people. And um, they're actually looking for people that they can share the gospel to. And we thought we're just bringing them there to see the sights, but they actually are so gospel-centered that anywhere they go, they share the gospel. So they struck up conversations with people they were able to share the gospel to. We go to the cashier, they give a tract. And last time also when we were going to the Staten Island Ferry, him and Brother Karim were just talking about the, whether, as if, um, they're just talking about the gospel, to let others, other people know about the gospel. Anyway, spending time with him, you know that you have spent time with the Lord. And um, we are so privileged to have him here, uh, back. And um, he, he actually is a, been asking people to pray for him and I'm privileged enough to be part of the prayer um, people who pray and one of the prayer requests that he always asks is please pray that I would be like Jesus <clears throat> Queen's Bible Church let me introduce to you a servant of God Brother Jay Thank you very gracious very Certainly the goodness of the Lord and not anything of ourselves. I know it's a dangerous...
wanted to start mentioning names for fear of forgetting someone, but a, a grateful heart uh, should never be kept silent. So we'd like to we'd like to thank Brother Ray for his uh, just loving hospitality. What a Two very delightful sisters in your midst, Sister Salvin and Sister Emily, who have made so many arrangements for our visit. I'd like to thank the, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing right, I still don't have a Filipino tongue yet, even after uh, 20 years of marriage, but I'm uh, thankful for the Jokson family, for their hospitality at the Bible study last night, for Sister Epi so uh, graciously wanting to spend time with us and giving us the privilege of spending time with her this morning. And of course for uh, Pastor Serrano and his, his wife just for this uh, invitation to be here with you. What an exciting day see these lovely young ladies anticipating a new chapter in their lives, to hear the beautiful worship music, the choir leading us into the presence of the Lord, all of the, the hustle and bustle downstairs in the kitchen. And, I know our mouths are already beginning to want water in anticipation of the dinner together. But I believe that uh, the Lord has a, a time now for the Word and has put a word in our heart for you this morning. I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We'll begin with verse 15. Romans chapter 1. And we'll begin with verse 15. I should probably mention, I don't want to take a lot of time and talk about advancing native missions. That's the ministry I work with, as Sister Salva shared. If you want to know something about that, we did bring a display. There's some literature, newsletters, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, please help yourself, and if you'd like to know more, uh, don't hesitate to leave your address. We won't bombard you with stuff, but uh, we would love to keep in touch with you and share a little bit about what the Lord's doing. If you have questions about that, we can talk later, but I, I really want to get into the Word right now. Romans chapter 1, verse 15. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, I have nothing to offer this morning, and I know that, and I acknowledge it, unless you anoint me with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that the Word will go forth in power and truth, and that you'll hide me behind the cross so I won't get in the way or hinder what you desire to do this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'll open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, open our hearts to understand what you're speaking to us today. And, Lord, I pray that you'll use it for the building of your kingdom, for the publishing of the proclamation of your great name and for your glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. As we were preparing for this visit, and let me wish a happy anniversary to each of you for 28 years of God's faithfulness. And that also comes from your friend, Brother Bo, and Sister Marlou Barreto, and for Brother Pete and Melody Wong co-workers of mine, for Brother Kareem and his family. Thank you for your partnership with us through the years. But as, as I was preparing for this weekend, I was able to have several nice conversations with Pastor Serrano, and, and he, he's been sharing with me some of what the Lord has been doing under his leadership, and, and even prior to, as you're a church seeking to become and becoming gospel Center. What, what a beautiful phrase that is. Can you just maybe say it gospel-centered? 
Doesn't that just taste sweet? To be gospel centered. What, what is sweeter? What is better? What is more wonderful than the gospel of Jesus Christ? By which we have been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And, and I was just, and, and still remain intrigued by this expression, gospel centered. And as I was preparing, I thought, well, let me Google that and just see what comes up. And it's amazing the number of resources that will be listed on your computer screen. Consider these different books. There's the Gospel Centered Life. There's 365 days to a Gospel Centered Faith. Gospel Centered Productivity. Gospel Centered Ministry. Conduct Gospel Centered Funerals. Gospel Centered Teaching. Gospel Centered Guide to Discipleship. The Gospel Centered Woman. Gospel Centered Hermeneutics. Gospel Centered Marriage. Even Gospel Centered Parenting. And as I went through the list, I kept waiting to see it, but it never popped up. Gospel Centered Missions. So I decided that's going to be our topic this morning. That's where I'd like to approach you from because anniversaries are not just wonderful times for looking back. But it's also a wonderful time to anticipate what remains in the future. So we'll be looking at gospel-centered missions. You see, when we consider missions, most mission appeal, most mission challenges, and even missions work itself, sometimes are presented as being very man-centered and not gospel-centered. Because it's easy for us, with our emotions, with, with our human understanding, to look at the needs of people, to look at their need to be saved, to look at their need to have their lives improved, to look at the need for their, their society to be changed. And then we work as if that's our chief end, and that's our chief purpose. Now, indeed, men need to be saved. And I believe through the salvation of men that society changes and lives become better. But when we talk about gospel-centered missions, our focus shifts, and it's not about people first, but it's first about the gospel. And of course, we know that the gospel is centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So gospel-centered missions are missions that first and foremost are glorifying to God. And we see that in the life of Jesus. Because Jesus' work, according to Romans chapter 15, was a work first and foremost to glorify God. He came into this world to show that God is truthful, that God keeps His promises, and that God indeed is glorious. And Jesus came into the world for the sake of the gospel. Jesus came as a gospel-centered incarnation. 100% man, 100% God, so that the gospel would be brought to us, and in the process, God's integrity would be established, God's word would be vindicated, and God's glory would be magnified. Because Jesus said, I've come to glorify God in everything. Consider these words from John chapter 7. He said, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Now when we can grab this idea that everything God does first, his priority is for His own glory, for His own name's sake. It will not only change the way that we view missions from being man-centered to gospel-centered, but it will change the way that we continue to view church, where it's not about us, but it's about Him. It will change the way that we do life, where it's not about us, but it's about Him. It, it will cause us 
to be less focused on ourselves, man-centered, and thus ultimately of somewhat corrupted motivations, but we will be gospel-centered, God-centered, Christ-centered, and there's no greater motivation for everything that we do. Now the reason this can be tough sometimes to wrap our mind around is because we have a human nature tendency to view God in our own image. If I were here this morning to talk about myself, to proclaim about myself, to try to build myself up, to give myself glory, you, you would be disgusted. That man is full of pride. That man is arrogant. That man is self-centered. When we're focused on ourselves, it's an ugly thing. But when God is focused on Himself, it's a beautiful thing because the overflow of that are all of the blessings that we enjoy. And I'm going to show you this from Scripture this morning. So when we can grab this idea that when we're gospel-centered, Christ-focused, God-centered, it changes the way we view life, the way we view missions, even the way we view things like suffering and persecution. Because we realize it's not about us. It's about Him. And everything we do, including church, including missions, becomes gospel-centered. Now let me demonstrate this to you. First of all, our first point this morning, gospel-centered missions recognizes God's desire, which is to be glorified. God desires to be glorified in us. Why were we created? According to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 6 through 7, we were created for the glory of God. The scripture says, I will say to the north, give up. To the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. That's missions. Bring everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I formed and made. We were not only created for His glory, but He chose us for His glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has blessed us in the beloved. You know, we can enter into the throne room boldly of God and bring our petitions and our needs and our praise. We can call Him Abba, Father, meaning Daddy. We've been called sons of the living God heirs of Jesus Christ, joint heir, or heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Think of all the benefit and blessing of that, but why did he do it? Not first for our benefit, but first for his glory, for the glory of his praise. So we enjoy the blessings of life. In him we live and move and have our being. We enjoy an inheritance that one day we will fully enjoy when we're in the presence of God. And it's not because of who we are, but because of who He is and His desire to be glorified. We are blessed when God is glorified. What about forgiveness of sin? Were we forgiven so we would be free from the penalty of hell? Were we free, freely forgiven so that we would be free from the wrath of God? Well, these are benefits. These are side effects. But according to Scripture, Isaiah 43, verse 25, the Lord says, I, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Not first for your sake, but first for His sake. And I will not remember your sins anymore. You see, a gospel-centered mission, a gospel-centered life, a gospel-centered church is a church that recognizes God's desire is to be glorified 
and then is living and doing everything for the glory of God. You see, God's desire is to be glorified in us, and He is when we surrender to the gospel, when we repent our sins and put our trust in Jesus Christ, He is glorified, and all of the benefits we have spring from that, but it's His desire also to be glorified through us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 16, to do good works. Why? Not so our brother can pat us on the back and say, good job, well done. Now there's nothing wrong with encouraging one another, we should. But Jesus said, do good works so that men will see your good works and not pat you on the back. But they'll see your good works and they'll give glory to God. That's what a gospel-centered mission and church and life is all about. Revealing God through what we do, what we say, even what we think. One of the scriptures I like to meditate on is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says that everything we do, whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, should be for the glory of God. I want you to think about this for a minute. How many of you enjoy coffee? Okay. I love a good cup of coffee. I love the flavor. I love the smell. I love the heat. I love the way it feels just going down the back of my throat. Have you ever thought about coffee? Somewhere years, maybe centuries back, some guy somewhere in the world saw this bush with these little red berries on it. And he just had an idea, I'll pick that little red berry. And I'm going to peel that skin off of it. I'm going to take that little green bean that's inside, and I'm going to put it in a frying pan. I'm going to put it over the fire. I'm going to just start roasting it. He's probably waiting and seeing it turn brown and then black and starting to smell it. And he has this idea. I wonder if I just ground that up and put it in some water, what would it taste like? Now, you may question my theology, but I believe that's inspired by God. And when I taste a good cup of coffee, I can rejoice and give glory to God. Think about all the treats we're going to have this afternoon. I don't know what's on the, the menu, but think, for example, about adobo. Who had this idea to mix vinegar and soy sauce? and put in a little bit of crushed garlic, maybe some black peppercorns, maybe a bagel, maybe some kind of other little secret ingredient that you don't tell anybody about. And to put in chicken or pork or potatoes or maybe even quail eggs and how wonderful and tasty it is. To God be the glory. You see, that's what a Christ-centered, gospel-centered life is all about. That everything we do and say and speak and encourage one another and live and our actions point to God. Because indeed, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of light to whom there is no variableness, neither shame. And when our lives are pointing to Him, men will give praise to Him, even sometimes non-believers. I love the verse on the worship folder this morning. It's really my wife and I's theme verse. Psalm 126, verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. I love the rest of that psalm. It starts out this way. When the Lord turned again our captivity from Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our hearts were filled with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Turn again, O Lord, our captivity as the streams in the south. For they that sow in tears will reap in joy. He that goeth forth bearing a precious gift. And is there any more precious gift than the gift of the gospel? He that goeth forth bearing a precious gift shall doubtless come again, bring in the harvest. For they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
You see, God's desire for a gospel-centered mission is to recognize His desire to be glorified. It's also to realize what His command is. You see, it's so easy to, to see missions and to see outreach. It's just something optional. Let's get done all of our other activities, all of our other things, and if there's time left, if there's resources left, we'll be involved in outreach. No. Consider the last words of Jesus. Wouldn't we agree that somebody's last words are among the most important they'll ever say? I remember when I went to Columbia for the first time, it was still considered a very dangerous place. I didn't remind my wife to take out the trash. I didn't remind her to check the mail, to pay the bills of my responsibilities. I didn't care about that. My last words to her before I left for Columbia were important things. Where's the will? Where's the insurance papers? How much I love her. How much I love my children. Jesus' last words to us are, go to all nations and proclaim the gospel. You're so blessed here in New York because all the nations are right here. You don't have to go very far. Go to the entire world in Mark 16 and preach the gospel. Repentance and forgiveness of sins, Luke chapter 24, should be preached to all nations. And in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, the last recorded words of Jesus while he was still on the earth, go as my witnesses throughout the earth. You see, missions was the call of God in the Old Testament to his chosen ones. And missions was the work of Jesus Christ who came both as a cross-cultural missionary and as a native missionary and it's the command of the church today. And, and that's why the psalmist could write, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. God, it's all about you. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory cover all of the earth. You see, our love for God which is demonstrated, if you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. And sometimes if you're wondering, where am I in relationship to the Lord? That can be a real good gauge. Just examine yourself. And are you keeping His commandments? Then it's a demonstrable fruit of your love for the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. And that should transform the way that we pray, the way that we give, the way that we go, the way that we live, the way that we do, the way that we talk, the way that we think, so that we become gospel-centered, not just in church, not just in missions, but we have a gospel-centered life. You see, gospel-centered missions recognize God's desire to be glorified, realize His command to go out and share the gospel, but it also remembers His promises. We think, well, it's hard. People aren't going to listen. People aren't going to hear. And there are some who won't listen. There are some who won't hear. There are some who will be insulting. We shouldn't be surprised because Jesus told us, if they hated me, they're sure going to hate you because they're going to see me in you. But to those who are being saved, the gospel is the most tremendous, terrific news that has ever been proclaimed. And God has promised in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 to fill the earth with the knowledge of His glory. In Psalm 22, God has promised that the nations will remember and turn to the Lord. They will worship Him. They will recognize His kingship and His rule. God promised in Isaiah 61 that righteousness and praise will sprout up before all the nations. And he said in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. It's going to happen. It's guaranteed. It's a promise. And you may be thinking, well, if it's going to happen, then why do I need to get involved? Because God commanded us to involvement and rather than seeing the promise that it will happen as an excuse not to get involved, 
It should be the very thing that encourages our hearts to know that our involvement is not going to be wasted. That it's not going to be in vain. It's going to happen. God, the Almighty, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has invited us to partner with Him. I can remember hearing an illustration that I love. How many of you remember Michael Jordan? Maybe you remember the name at least. One of the greatest basketball players who's ever played the game. When he was with the Chicago Bulls, there was a game. The Bulls were ahead by 68 points, I think, last few minutes of the game. And a rookie was put in. He'd never been on the court before in a major league game. But at this point, there's no way they could lose, so the coach put him in. He scored a basket. First major league basket. And after the game, it was a runaway. The reporters were all crowding to Michael Jordan. But one guy, I'm going to go interview the rookie. And he interviewed the rookie. How does it feel to be out there? What, what was your first game like? He said, man, we had a great game tonight. Me and Michael Jordan made 70 points. <laughs> he made one basket. You see, and God does a work. And He lets us have a part in it. Because He will be glorified. And He invites us to be part of how He is glorified. Gospel-centered missions recognize God's desire to be glorified, realizes the truth of His command, and again, I stress to you, brothers and sisters, it's a command, not an option, to be involved in giving Him glory among the nations through the proclamation of the gospel. It's also realizing His promises that our labors will not be in vain, and even if it seems like nothing's happening, even if it seems like we're not accomplishing anything, we can rest assured that God's Word never returns void. It's also a time to rejoice in both His presence and in His return. You see, when the Lord said go, He also said, and I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. He called himself and presented himself in scriptures as Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He said in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in 2 Timothy, Paul encouraged Timothy this way. He said, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles... And that word Gentiles is the Greek word ethnos, meaning every people group, every nation, every tribe, so that all of them will hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. I can remember a story of, of one of our missionary partners, Brother Prim Pradhan. Some people believe that he was probably the very first Christian in the entire country of Nepal in the modern times. He was a soldier serving in the Indian Army. He was at a gospel crusade. His heart was changed. He was born again. He resigned his military commission, went back to Nepal, and began to preach the gospel. Three men heard, believed, and were transformed. And when the government found out, Prem Pradhan and these three men were arrested. Each of the three men were sentenced, as I recall, to three years in prison. And Prim Pradhan to seven years in prison for each of the men, 21 year sentence. He was put into a cell with, with other prisoners and the general population. He began to share the gospel. And people were being saved and transformed. And when their terms were up, sentences were finished, they were going back to their villages as missionaries. And when the government found out what was happening, they moved Prim to a part of the uh, prison he told me in his words it was for the insane people. But when he got there, he realized some of these people just needed healing. They were ill. They were mentally unstable. And he prayed for them, and he encouraged them, and they were not only healed, but transformed by the gospel. And then the guards would be called, you're holding this man, examine him. There's nothing wrong with him. And they were going back as missionaries of their own people. And in the words of Prim Pradhan, he said, at that point, they moved me 
And he called it, he used the word morgue, to the morgue, but not the sterile kind of clean environment like we see on television. No, he described it as, as a cave and a pit where if the bodies of the dead weren't collected by the family in three days, they were thrown in that pit. And he said, I had to push aside the remains and the smell was overpowering. And at that moment, I was at my lowest point ever. And I cried out, God, I have served you faithfully. Why in my moment of desperation have you abandoned me? And Prim said he heard a voice. He didn't know if it was audible or still of his heart. But he knew it was the voice of God saying, Prim Pradhan, I once suffered for you. And even now, I'm suffering with you. And in a moment of conviction, that is lack of faith, Prem told me that he raised his hands and he began to praise God. Began to cry out to the Lord. And he caused such a commotion, one of the guards came. What's going on down there? Prem put on, I'm talking to Jesus. Sir, you've gone crazy. You're down here alone. No, sir, Jesus is down here. And the guard went and got a torch and came back and shined it down in the cave. I told you no one's in there. You've gone mad. No, sir. Jesus is here. Let me introduce you to him. Just like in the book of Acts, in the Corinthian jail, Brother Prim Pradhan shared the gospel because his was a gospel-centered life and mission. And that guard was transformed. And there's so much I could tell about that story. I don't have time. But eventually Prim Pradhan was released early and traveled the world sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because his heart was in tune with his Savior and his life was gospel-centered. He closed with this. Gospel-centered mission recognizes God's desire to be glorified, realizes his command is to go and to tell. It recognizes that His presence goes with us because His promises will be fulfilled. And it also causes our hearts to long for His return. See, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us that Christ's return is for the glory of God. His aim, according to John chapter 17, is for us to see and to enjoy His glory. Everything that happens, according to Romans 11.36, is for His glory. And it's God's glory itself that will light the new Jerusalem. It's all about Him, church. It's all about Him. What we think in the privacy of our home is about Him. It should be. What we do when we come together to worship what we'll do this afternoon in fellowship downstairs, we'll enjoy it. We get the benefits of the wonderful meal and the sweet fellowship, but it's all about Him. And how we commute back and forth to work, how we speak to our co-workers, how we address the cashier at the bank, at the grocery store, it's all about Him. It's all about Him. Here's our dilemma. We know it's all about Him. And because we've been born again and we're abiding in the vine, Scripture says we will bear fruit. And it's good fruit that will remain. But at the same time, we're still in a body of flesh, in a sin-cursed, sin-soaked world. So bearing fruit comes naturally as those abiding in the vine. But at the same time, there's something about it that's purposeful. Where everything we do, we're conscious. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about the gospel. And at first it seems daunting. At first it seems intimidating. We have to struggle and fight because our... 
leans always, that it's, it's really about me. No, it's about Him. And when we can just grasp that and make it such a part of our lives, eventually it will become more natural. And not only will it bless the unbelievers in your communities, not only will it bless your family, not only will it bless your brothers and sisters, but it's the greatest, richest, deepest blessing you'll ever experience. Behold, friends, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that, he should, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That's the goal of the gospel-centered life, church, mission, ministry, to be more like Jesus. And there's a day coming. We don't know exactly what it means, but Scripture tells us that there's a day coming when we're focused and centered on Him, that we will be like Him, because we'll see him as he is. Happy anniversary, dear friends. And may God make you. May God make you more gospel centered every day of your lives. Thank you, Brother Jay. We come now to our tithes and offering. Let me read to you Luke chapter 3. Jesus said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied to them, The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by false or false accusation. By force or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. And then came the baptism of Jesus. When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized as he was praying. Heaven opened up and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved son. I take delight in you. Let's pray. Father, your words are very clear that when we are baptized and identified with Christ, then we are to bear fruit. And our fruit should remain. Because every fruit, everyone who doesn't bear fruit, will be thrown into the fire, like you said. And this may mean that we will be cut off from our fellowship with you. Father, help us at this time that we may have struggles in our life that are going on and that keep us from giving back to you our lives and our resources. But we know, Lord, that you're able to meet our needs. You're able to provide in abundance. So that when we give to others who are in need, the extra shirt that we have, when we don't complain about our situation financially because we are satisfied with what we have. When we don't do what you've asked us to do, you've told us, you command us to center our light on you, Lord. Help us 
so that our lives may bear fruit. Because you alone, by your grace, as a gift from you, are able to do that. Thank you for your gifts. And we give back to you a portion of that gift. We give back to you what you have entrusted to us. And may you be pleased with our offering, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 6. And we'll do verses 1 to 14. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. This talks about baptism and dying to our old self, dying to sin and living for Christ. This is what the main message of this chapter is about. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, and uh, all the brethren of the um, it is indeed a joyous occasion that we can celebrate the baptism of four of our young ladies. And I would like to call on them to please stand over there by the side. I should recognize that um, this preparation for baptism of these girls not only is in cooperation with the parents, but also I'm glad to say that um, I was helped by Brother RJ, uh, my daughter Cherise, uh, Sister Kate Binag, and Genevieve, and uh, the De Leons, the De Leons, uh, Joshua and Sam are all in this together as well. And your prayers for them during the prayer meeting have brought us to this day. May I present to you our candidates for baptism holding their baptismal certificates um, in the order in which they are going to be baptized alphabetically. So we have, uh, and I don't I make a mistake here, Bea Tolentino. Aisa Campos. Gillian Tobias. And Bay Wayne. We would like to explain that um, we had time to uh, give them instruction about uh, baptism and uh, they have indicated that they are ready to be baptized. And two of them will actually be reading their testimonies at this time. Um, Bea will go first and Kaisa next. Good afternoon everyone. I didn't memorize my testimony but I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> Um, in the Philippines, there's a saying, and it says, that ulamang, which means for only human. There's no way to be certain of anything. It's human nature to want more, to need more, before making a commitment. I grew up in a Catholic church and would go to Mass every week where I would sleep until it was time to go to Sunday school. At Sunday school, half the class was in English and the other half was in Spanish to accommodate the Spanish speakers in my neighborhood. Needless to say, I fell asleep there too. 
since no hablo español. <laughs> My thirst for God was never awakened, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if I had a longing for God. I knew he was there, but he was never here, never in my life. Church was just a routine, a time for me to get extra sleep. Then we went to QBC, and a memory I distinctly have is singing Shalom at Vacation Bible School. And there was a community of people rejoicing in their shared love of the Lord. It was the first time I truly felt alive. It was like I had been breathing in empty air, and suddenly my lungs were filled with something substantial something worthwhile. But another part of human nature is pride. As I grew in my faith, I also grew in my knowledge. I used my knowledge to hide, to put up a wall around my heart. In the VBS of 2008, a VBS leader led me to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior after explaining that it was a spiritual birthday and that only through the repentance of my sin can I truly be saved. Now, through playing music as a part of the praise and worship team, I grow in my relationship with God. Through music, I'm able to see the reason why Christ resonates with me and why he gave me life. I know I'm never alone, whether it's at school or anywhere else, and can rest assured that God is always there as my guide, protector, and comforter. Although I'm still a work in progress, I know with God, I will only get better. By deciding to get baptized, I am making a public declaration of my desire to know my God better and my acknowledgement of the fact that I am nothing without God. Uh, growing up in Queens Bible Church, I thought I was expected to know everything about Christ along with all the right answers to the Sunday school questions. Before accepting Christ, I had no care about my future and no care about how my actions would affect others, and basically just how much I sin. What brought me to accepting Christ was the many mistakes I am not proud of, the amount of loved ones I disappointed, and the look of my parents' face this one day. Um. leader <laughs> and since then I have been much more prayerful more conscious about my actions and my relationship with the Lord just continues to get stronger the baptism classes has helped me realize that I am a work in progress but I'm proud of it thank you give us the great commission and we can read it together in unison, read with me. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end. You know, um, this is, we're doing this in obedience to the Lord's command. And we know that Jesus himself was also baptized. Baptism does not save. It is not a way to wash away anyone's sin. But it is symbolic of what Jesus has already done in these terms, as you have heard. So they have read the testimonies, so they are now saved. And it's this water of baptism as... Deus, Deus, Deus said, it's a public, Deus, said, it's a public declaration of what has gone on in her heart. And we do this, Lord, also because we know that as followers of Jesus Christ, they would need our support and our help. So may I call on them one at a time. First, um, Bea, Yeah, I know that you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life. Do you, uh, let's repeat your baptismal vows this time. You actually um, repent. And you are willing to follow the Lord 
as personal garden. I do. Bea, do you actually, um, will you actually strive and try to follow the Lord Jesus Christ throughout your life by obeying His Word and by faithfully um, listening to His Spirit in, that lives within you? I do. And should in the future you desire to go, the Lord should desire or will that you go to another church, will you continue serving Him in that church and faithfully follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Bea Valentina, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good Christ from God. Very good Christ from God. Praise to you, Lord. your um, baptismal vows. Have you turned from your sin and repented in faith? Turned to Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Have you actually received the Holy Spirit of God and you will listen to Him, follow Him and obey Him for as long as you should live here on earth and beyond, of course, and that you will faithfully obey His word? Yes, I will. And in the event that God should lead you to another church in the future, would you faithfully follow Him too in that church? I will. Kaiser Santos, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. Christ in baptism. Grace to you. Dear brothers and sisters, this is Julian, our youngest of uh, this kind day today. Julian, I'd like to repeat, we'd like to repeat your baptismal vows. Have you repented of your sins and turned to Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Have you actually received the Spirit of God by doing that and you know that He lives in you and you want to faithfully follow Him and obey His word? And it should as the Lord decide in the future where the church that you might go to might be different, will you continue to serve Him in that church? <coughs> I baptize you, Gideon, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. Praise to the new Lord. as well and the help of the Holy Spirit. We are together celebrating this. Right, Brother Young? And that goes for all the parents too. Wait, wait. Let's just repeat quickly your vows. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And have you actually repented of your sin? Have you received the Holy Spirit in your heart by receiving Christ? And do you follow, would you follow Him and obey His word? And in the future, should you decide to go to a different church, but the Lord takes you there, will you continue to serve Him there? Wait, wait. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to the newness of life. Sundays ago, we've conducted a ministry fair 
and most of us have signed up for uh, a, a ministry that we can get involved in. And the song is entitled, Use Me. And I think it is, we think that it is just fitting for us to hear a message, a reminder uh, from God that as He has used Moses, as He has used David, He can use us. He can use us. And I hope that you will be inspired by the message of the song. Thank you. Shepherd. 
that's already sitting at a table, great. That's going to be your team for this uh, for this game that we got planned. And this game is called uh, Church History and Trivia Facts. All right. Hazel is going to go around and pass out uh, two pieces of paper. So if you guys have a, a pen or a pencil, then um, have those handy. If not, we can provide you with a crayon to write with. So two pieces of paper, on one side you're gonna write A, the letter A, the other side the letter B, and then that second sheet of paper, the letter C. These are gonna be your answer choices that the table is gonna answer with, all right? We have prepared some uh, set of questions about our church's QBC history, and we're gonna ask them, and then everybody at the same time um, is gonna give up their answer. So whoever at the end of this game comes up with the, or whichever table has the most points, wins a little prize as well too, so uh, the prize is a surprise, which we will announce. All right, question three. Which city was QBC first located? Was it A, Maspa, B, Corona, or C, Middle Village? year did we move to our own church here in Glendale? Was it A, December 2007, B, January 2006, or C, November 2008? November. Eight, eight. Nobody knows. Alright, the answer is A. Number six, um, who was our first youth pastor? Was it A, Pastor Steve, B, Pastor Eric, or C, Dante Cezanne? Pennsylvania or C, Honolulu, Hawaii. So three more tips was QBC's first family camping trip. Hint, we also held BDS there. Was it A, the Lou residence? B, the Madahe residence? Or C, the Sporo residents. Hey, hey. Alright, the answer is A. Hey. Hey. You guys start writing, okay? What is QBC's vision statement? Go.